here. Now, broadcasting from, from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, everybody. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have some good news for you. Two senators, neither of whom are big-time conservatives, by the way. Charles Grassley, who's chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and Lindsey Graham, have officially and formally requested that the Department of Justice open a criminal investigation into this guy, Christopher Steele. Now, this guy, Christopher Steele, as you recall, is the ex-British spy. Hired by Fusion GPS, which was hired by the Hillary Clinton and the DNC campaigns through a front man, a front lawyer, a guy by the name of Elias, working at a major law firm. So, in essence, the Fusion GPS hit piece was paid for by Hillary Clinton's campaign and the DNC, which is one of the major reasons the uh, Praetorian Guard media in this country all but ignore it. And, of course, uh, the founders of Fusion GPS are three Wall Street Journal left-wing reporters uh, who actually came out of the closet, stopped pretending to be journalists, and became partisans. Now, why did Grassley and Graham formally ask the FBI and the Justice Department in a letter with a classified memoranda a memorandum uh, appended to it to conduct a criminal investigation of Mr. Steele. Well, they think Mr. Steele lied to the FBI. Mr. Grassley said that given some Trump campaign figures have been hit with criminal charges for lying to the FBI, it's fair that Mr. Steele, a Democratic-backed operative, face the same scrutiny. Grassley said, I don't take lightly making a referral for criminal investigation. But, as I would with any credible evidence of a crime unearthed in the course of our investigations, I feel obliged to pass that information along to the Justice Department for appropriate review. Everyone needs to follow the law and be truthful in their interactions with the FBI, he said. The same actions have different outcomes, and those differences seem to correspond to partisan political interests, and the public will naturally suspect the law enforcement decisions are not on the up and up. Now, Graham said there ought to be a special counsel on this Fusion GPS dossier and uh, Mr. Steele. He said after reviewing how Mr. Steele conducted himself and distributing information contained in the dossier and how many stop signs the DOJ ignored in its use of the dossier, I believe that a special counsel needs to review this. You know know what is amazing to me? Month after month after month, This government will not tell us if it unleashed its domestic and political surveillance of the Trump campaign and Trump transition team as a result of this foreigner, this former British spy, being paid for, ultimately, by the Hillary Clinton campaign and the DNC, that put together a document he did, again, paid by the opposition, And whether that document was used by the FBI to seek one or two FISA warrants, among other things. Now, I have believed from day one that it was. But that's not good enough, what I believe. The FBI will not tell us. Nobody's saying that the FBI should reveal classified information. Nobody's saying that the Department of Justice should reveal classified information. We would like to know... If Mr. Steele and this dossier he put together with the help of the Kremlin, hello, with the help of the Russians, which had as its purpose to take out Donald Trump candidate, to smear Donald Trump president-elect. For all the talk of collusion, here we have multiple examples of collusion with the Russians by the left, by the Democrat Party, by the Hillary Clinton campaign, and by their surrogates. 
Why can we not know, the American people, if in fact the Hillary Clinton paid for, the DNC paid for, Russian-influenced document trashing the President of the United States and his candidacy, why can't we know whether or not that was used in front of a federal judge, a so-called foreign, uh, a FISA court judge, to issue a warrant to allow surveillance of an opposition candidate. Let me cut to the chase so even Brian Stelter at CNN can understand. Let me cut to the chase so even the slobs over there at Media Matters can understand. The issue is whether the domestic and political surveillance that took place in this country against all our traditions, against our laws, whether or not the FISA court was deceived with the use of opposition research used by the Hillary Clinton campaign and the DNC containing information provided by the Kremlin, their apparatchiks, whether that information was used primarily or at all to secure FISA court warrants against anyone in Trump world or the Trump organization. Why can't we get an answer to this? Devin Nunes, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, is trying to get an answer to this. You'll recall he's been trashed by fellow Republicans, particularly in the Senate, who sit on their butts over there at the Senate Intelligence Committee. What an ironically named committee. It should be the Senate Stupidity Committee. And now on the Senate Judiciary Committee, we actually have two senators who are trying to get to the bottom of this, Graham and Grassley. And that's a good thing. But as I've been saying now, what, since March, Mr. Producer? This is the biggest scandal of scandals. Not this book. None of this. The biggest scandal of scandals is whether, in fact, and I believe it occurred, there was domestic surveillance by federal law enforcement at the highest levels, by our federal intelligence operations at the highest levels, to elect Hillary Clinton, to take out Donald Trump, whether they did in fact use foreign sources to do so. We know Mr. Steele's a foreigner. We know he used Russian sources in part for his 36-page dossier. The question is whether unconstitutionally, illegally, an opposition party working with the president and his administration, maybe not him directly, but others, who are of the same party, one after the candidate of the other party, and did so unconstitutionally and illegally. Now, when I brought this up in March, early March, I was attacked. But everything I said then has proven accurate. Everything. When I mentioned the likelihood of at least one attempt by the FBI and the Justice Department under Obama to get a FISA court warrant based on published reports. I just connected the dots. I was attacked by CNN, Brian Stelter, Towson State's hero. I was attacked by Brian Ross, who's no longer reporting. He's in the witness protection program for, uh, for uh, failed reporters. I was attacked by the Associated Press, which has never issued an apology. I was attacked by the conga line of freaks and morons and low IQ types who call themselves hosts over there at MSNBC. We still need to know about the dossier and its use by the top levels of the Obama administration. The NSC, the NSA, the CIA, the FBI, and all the rest of it. And we can't seem to get an answer. One day we might. But we can't seem to get an answer right now. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I thought 
thought I'd bring a real journalist on the program. It breaks a lot of stories uh, related to the FBI and things that took place during the course of the election. An old buddy of mine, John Solomon of the Hill. How are you, John? I'm doing well, Mark. Good to be with you. Well, you had two big stories that I wanted to address. First of all, Comey's original Clinton memo released, possible violations. I looked at this memo yeah, it's and your story. Memo, and it? It, well, what's amazing to me is how many times they cross out grossly negligent, which are the key words in the espionage statute. That's right. That's right. You know, if you go back to a year ago, you look at all the media reports, and the media reports said that James Comey cleared Hillary Clinton. When you look at this initial draft, he wasn't intending to clear her at all. He was intending to say that she basically broke the statute, but I'm not willing to take the risk of prosecuting her and losing. Mm-hmm. And um, and then these, these FBI agents come in, and they do one heck of an editing job. Anything that's uh, potentially damaging to Hillary Clinton, they edit out. Now, uh, this document, which I believe was uh, secured by Senator Ron Johnson, is that correct? That's right. Yep, the chairman of the Senate House uh, Home, uh, Homeland Security uh, Committee, right. Are they going to dig to try and figure out who these uh, geniuses were around Comey who crossed out all this language? That is a question that we're still trying to get answered. We have a, um, a an uncertainty. We think it's Pete Stroke, the agent who has those famous politicized uh, text messages with his girlfriend, but we're not 100% sure yet, nor is Congress. So that's one of the questions that Devin Nunez just got permission to get answered. Uh, the Justice Department came by and finally gave Congress that question. But we think it's the small group around uh, uh, Comey, which was uh, uh, the names Rebicki, uh, uh, Stroke, uh, and uh, Baker. James Baker. Yep, the counsel, right. Well, here, here's, you know, James Comey every now and then he tweets out stuff like about the politicization of the FBI and shouldn't we have an independent FBI. I, I, I find these tweets amazing because, in fact, he did politicize the FBI, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, I listen, uh, I remember there was a moment in one of his uh, uh, congressional appearances where he says the FBI agents don't give a rip about politics. Well, he sure looks silly now after we've seen all these text messages from Stroke and and uh, the other woman. And, and I think we I'm hearing from multiple sources that there are other senior FBI and Justice Department officials for whom they found politically charged emails suggesting they didn't like it. Uh, Donald Trump, might have been out to get Donald Trump, that are going to come forward in the next few weeks. You look kind of silly if you're the director and you, you give this assurance that your department was engaged in politics and then all these text messages come out and show that uh, politics was everywhere. It is quite frightening. I speak as an old chief of staff to an attorney general myself during the Reagan right. administration. I have to tell you, John Solomon, it is frightening to me that you have this kind of politicization of law enforcement at the highest levels and the Democrat Party is doing all it can to downplay this, is it not? Yeah, because it runs contrary to their to the narrative that they tried to set up at the beginning of the Trump presidency. And that narrative, as, as you and I have talked before, it was going to unravel, and it has begun to unravel. And and uh, there's two things going on. One is we uh, the idea that Hillary Clinton was thoroughly investigated has been completely debunked, both on her email and on her foundation. And then the idea that Donald Trump was in collusion with Russia and all of those hyperbolic stories that came out at the beginning of the presidency – uh, those are also unraveling. The, the, the evidence is getting smaller and smaller, and that's certainly their unresolved questions, but we should let the process finish uh, finish up. But uh, both of the Democrats' uh, main uh, narratives have evo- uh, devolved, and then you take the fact that the people who are driving those narratives, people in the intelligence community and the law enforcement community, are supposed to be apolitical, and you just see their outright partisanship. I mean, look at the former DNI Clapper. I mean, he could not be any more political than any intelligence official I've ever seen since he retired. Uh, I think there's there's going to be a day of reckoning where the intelligence community and law enforcement community is going to look back and say, you know what, we lost ourselves here. We got too political, and it's not good for for what has been a neutral, honest, you know, profession for a long time. The um, and 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 part of the thing that uh, always troubles me here, or actually very much troubles me here too, is um, Comey one day is trashed and despised by the Democrats because they feel they undermine Hillary. Then one second after Donald Trump fires him, all of a sudden this guy's angelic. Yeah, yeah very true, isn't it? Yeah, well, that shows you how fleeting politics is in Washington these days. Uh, there's no sense of um, a hypocrisy. It's whatever's convenient for the moment. And um, sadly, no, very few in the media hold those Democrats uh, accountable for those sudden flips. 
listen, James Comey, if you were blaming James Comey before the election that he ruined it, you can't, you can't hold him up as a hero afterwards for the same thing. I saw something interesting today uh, that gives you a sense of the bias. A Wall Street Journal reporter uh, tweeted out today that uh, Christopher Steele, the guy that wrote the dossier paid by Hillary Clinton and DNC, the reporter called him a whistleblower. He's not a whistleblower. He's a hired political guy. <laughs> and, and we just look at this stuff, and I look at my profession, and I wonder, where did all the common sense go? There was a time, I think, that the journalism profession was very noble, and, 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 uh, and, but we see so much today where uh, the partisans that are in the intelligence community, the law enforcement community, are embedded with the partisans that are now in my profession, and it, it deeply troubles me. Charles Grassley has said, uh, and he has said unequivocally, he believes that James Comey leaked classified memos or memos with classified information to his uh, law That's professor right. buddy. Do we know anything about that? Well, we know this week that uh, he formally sent a letter to the Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein asking him, what are you doing about this? There are four. Uh, I reported this back in July. In fact, it was the very first story I wrote at the Hill uh, when I started uh, that Comey had four memos that had classified information. He had testified he had no classified information in them. Now, uh, uh, Chuck Grassley did some great math, which is, all right, he says he leaked four memos, uh, and there's a total of seven. That means at least one of the ones he leaked had to be classified because there's only seven and four classified. He did mm-hmm. some common sense math, and, uh, and he's put the Justice Department on the spot to say, what are you doing about this? C- can prove me that I'm wrong or tell me that you're prosecuting them. And that's mm-hmm. what they're waiting for. And yet you look, you look at this, you, you look at this special counsel investigation who, who at least ostensibly was chasing collusion. He's not chasing collusion at all anymore. Right. Then you look at these stories you write and you look at other information out there, the overwhelming information on Uranium One, the overwhelming information on what Comey has done throughout all this, the overwhelming information on Fusion GPS. No special counsel, no special anything. Yeah, no, you're right. Uh, there hasn't been. And, you know, it's, it's interesting now. I, I look back at that news conference where Comey said he had no choice but to clear Hillary Clinton by himself because the Justice Department was corrupt, right? There was the whole question of the Lynch-Clinton meeting and other stuff that is now surfaced. But he actually did have another choice because Louis Free, 20 years earlier, did it. Louis Free called for the special counsel saying, I can't trust the Justice Department to investigate Bill Clinton, and there are specific statutory steps that the FBI director took, and he forced the, the what, what then was the appointment. Can you, can you uh, hold uh, for a few minutes and come back? Sure. We'll, we'll be right back. Plastic, conservative, fire. The Mark Levin Show. Call in now at 877-381-3811. John Solomon of the Hill Newspaper, a journalist extraordinaire, actually breaks real stories. Uh, doesn't sit there and just uh, by the old fax machine. Uh, John Solomon, so we now have an FBI investigation of the Clinton Foundation. When did this start and what's the subject? Yeah, the subject is, uh, was there pay-to-play politics going on? Were there favors being traded at the Clinton State Department in return for donations to the charitable uh, empire that they had built? Uh, it started a few months ago. Uh, I talked to one witness that was interviewed very thoroughly uh, just before Christmas, and uh, the questions were pretty pointed. Did you, uh, did you witness uh, money changing hands? Did you see promises being made? And uh, it looks like this is a full-scale investigation, and I really think it's what the FBI wanted to do Two years ago, there's been some great reporting done on this by the Wall Street Journal and others that said that the uh, FBI tried to investigate the foundation for possible criminal violations, and they were shut down by the Obama Justice Department in 2016. And I think these guys just uh, waited around, new administration came around, and they ramped up their investigation, and now they have the full support of the U.S. Attorney in Little Rock, and uh, a pretty significant investigation is ongoing. You know, you do these stories, and a lot of them deal with the FBI during the Obama administration, the Department of Justice yeah. during the Obama administration. You read Josh Meyer over there at Politico, who's under right. brutal assault by the left. He's done two amazing pieces also yeah. on what the Obama administration did with respect to Iran, how it covered up certain of these individuals who were passing That's technologies right. to Iran, his second piece on how it basically closed its eyes to Hezbollah and so forth. The manipulation, I'm telling you again, as an old Reagan guy who served at the Justice Department, 
The politicization and manipulation of the top levels of law enforcement, the Justice Department, the FBI, the CIA, these internet, these um, uh, national security agencies, I've never seen anything like this. Have you? No, there was a period of time, uh, particularly in the Loretta Lynch uh, era, where uh, the FBI clearly was reined in from doing things that... uh, that uh, would it normally would have been allowed to do as an independent agency, and and I think that we're now beginning to see the full extent of that political interference in that department. Uh, you know, there's another one that I, I've been working on, and I'm, I'm so fascinated by because I think it has enormous national security implications. There is no doubt that the Obama administration, through the work of the FBI, knew in 2009 and 2010 that Russia was engaged in bribery on U.S. soil involving our nuclear industry, bribing officials in our nuclear industry. And rather than bring it up or bring a prosecution at the time, they gave away not only Uranium One, you know, the the approval of that sale, but billions of dollars of new uranium contracts to uh, the Russian government uh, and turned a willful blind eye for four years to this this bribery. And, uh, And that sort of politicalization not only impacts the credibility of the department, it impacts our national security. Knowing that, knowing that, and knowing other things the Obama administration did to appease, if not to do even worse with respect to the Russians among other countries, to facilitate their interests, well, then why in the world would Vladimir Putin, this has never made any sense to me, be rooting for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton? Yeah, no, it's a great question, right? And uh, and, uh, I think there are some in the intelligence community that don't, necessarily subscribe to that uh, conclusion that was made in January just before President Obama left. Uh, the community as a whole still stands behind it, but I have talked to many people, and, and we even saw Mike Rogers, the NSA head, say that he wasn't as convinced as others. I think he said his confidence level was moderate at best in that assessment. Uh, I think it's more likely that, and, and I know everyone that I've talked to talks to agrees that Russia was just trying to sow distrust in our democracy, because if they can cause us to doubt our democracy, that furthers their goals more than picking Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton to win. And uh, I think when this investigation is all done, you're going to see some of these congressional committees come to a very different assessment than the intelligence community did in the final days of the Obama administration. Is it not possible, based on what you're saying, based on these other stories I've been reading, that the biggest sop, uh, the biggest, the biggest, uh, that, that took the fall for the Russians here, that took the bait, that bit the hook, would have been the highest levels of the FBI? It could be. I mean, we still need to know more about the, the, the full extent of the evidence. There is clearly evidence that Russia was involved in hacking. There was clearly evidence that they were trying to meddle in some ways. I don't think it's different than what they tried to do in 2012 or 2008, to be honest, from what I hear. But I think we still need to see the full body of evidence before we can make such a sweeping conclusion. I do think there is a very strong, growing body of evidence. I just went through today a whole bunch of text messages from a senior FBI official. I'm going to report on these next week you can see a very determined political uh, motive to the advancement of the Russia investigation in December and January of uh, 2016-2017. And to see that so raw in 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 a FBI agent's own text messages and emails, very disconcerting. You just don't expect the guys that hold the power of FISA and, and surveillance to have that sort of partisan mo- motive being expressed time and time again. And uh, I think that's going to be the part that we're going to remember from this investigation, a very partisan group of maybe a small group. It might only be a very small subset of the FBI that had a partisan agenda as they were doing this investigation. Wouldn't be the first time, would it? I mean, you know, you had the deputy director of the FBI during the Nixon period who wanted to be the director. There's a book that just came out on this. He was very upset about it. It's not that he was earnest or studious or had integrity or anything. He was furious that he was passed over. He wanted to be FBI director. That's and he right. starts leaking the investigative information nonstop to Woodward and Bernstein. There's an irony to that. And, and uh, I, I think there was a fun moment this week where James Comey tweeted out, the FBI should be independent. And Charles Grassley zinged him right back and said, that's what, her, uh, that's what Hoover used to say. And that didn't work out so well for us. Exactly. Um, I think it is. Yeah. I think that there, there was... In fact, John Solomon, just for the audience, let me go further. The reason there's a 10-year period yep. for an FBI director isn't so he's independent. It's so That's he's right. gone or she's gone That's in right. 10 years. Can't have that lifelong hold like Hoover did. The, um, there, there is, uh, uh, I think we will see that there's a small group of people, James Comey, 
and some of these other ones, uh, McCabe and, and uh, Stroke and others, that they drove this investigation. And it is entirely possible that politics, dislike, other things may have blinded them to some of the other evidence that was there that weighed differently to the, than the assessment that they gave. I think the assessment was clearly rushed. There was, Obama put a pressure on it to get it done before he left office. And I bet you we're going to learn there was leaking going on. We know that, that there was partisanship going on. And we're going to have to go back and reevaluate what we did in the uh, fall of 2016 and 2017 to get a more accurate picture. Let me ask you one more question before you go here, which is sure. this. We have a special counsel appointed without any criminal basis whatsoever in Robert Mueller. We have what was a counterintelligence investigation, not a criminal investigation, then transitions into a criminal investigation. We see the sorts of things he's investigating, which really has almost nothing to do with Russian collusion and so forth and so on. Right. You you have this overwhelming information, whether it's Uranium One, whether it's James Comey's conduct when it comes to the Clinton investigation, and you have Fusion GPS. These are three big deals. And then, of course, to me, the biggest scandal of, the all, of all is this domestic surveillance that took place, in my view, and the unmasking of individuals and so forth. Why are they so hesitant now at the Justice Department to appoint a special counsel in any of these cases, or one for all of these cases, where they were so quick to pull the trigger and appoint Mr. Mueller for a nothing case? Yeah, and it's, it's ironic, the people that are making... Let me start. So you think he's a straight... ...this decision in creating this goal for the people that Donald Trump actually put into the Justice Department, right, Jeff? That's, That's amazing. And Rod Rosenstein. Um, I have a high degree of confidence from my reporting that even absent a new special counsel, that there are some pretty serious, hard-driving investigations going on in the Trump Justice Department right now. I believe uh, there's a very strong... Uh, investigation going on with the inspector general that's going to hold an awful lot of people accountable. I'm hearing some pretty extraordinary things about what the IG has found and likely to conclude in the next couple of weeks. So let me uh, stop you before you go there. Yeah. Let me stop. So you think he's a straight shooter, even though he's an Obama appointee? I, I, I have seen a lot of evidence of very aggressive investigation. Very Good. aggressive investigation. Good. So, and then I think this Little Rock investigation is going to be one of the big stories of 2018. I think for the first time we're going to know whether all of these stories about pay to play are true and whether they rose to the level of crystal seeing evidence in the last few weeks that the email investigation, perhaps not the transmission of classified information, but the destruction of evidence and possible obstruction of justice in Congress may be becoming a very central focus of another investigation. So whether there's a special counsel or not, I am seeing some real strong evidence for the first time. and It's been a long time, but in the last three months, I'm seeing real evidence that the Justice Department is looking at these things with and putting full resources behind them. So you feel Jeff Sessions, at least in the areas where he can, is in fact uh, aggressively trying to pursue some of these issues, despite what some people are saying about him? Yeah, and, you know, I think the other thing is, remember, when the Justice Department works best, it isn't managed top down, right? It's the guys in the field, right, the U.S. attorney in Little Rock, the uh, SAC in Little Rock, just doing their jobs. I mean, in the Comey era, these things got sucked into Washington and micromanaged. But when the Justice Department is strongest, the people in the field make the right decisions, and they make it yeah. honestly, and then eventually they throw them up to justice to get the final charging decisions. I think that's what's going on here. A lot of U.S. attorneys and FBI agents, are just doing uh, law enforcement the way it was always intended to be done. And it may have a large, larger consequence than Republicans and others are appreciating right now. There's a lot going on below our radar. Uh, and I think that revelation that, you know, yesterday when I broke the story about the foundation, that really caught a lot of people by surprise. But it's a very mm-hmm. advanced investigation. And uh, I think it's going to be one of the, the big storylines of 2018. All right, John Solomon, you know, look over your shoulder from time to time, my brother. And I and I very much appreciate what you're doing. It's very important for the country. Thank you. Well, thank you for the attention to give my story. It means a lot. All right, God bless. Fascinating, isn't it, Mr. Producer? It's, it's also fascinating how much politicization was taking place in departments and agencies that are not supposed to be politicized. And I have a question for you, ladies and gentlemen. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which oversees the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and this is where the FBI and Justice have to go in order to get a counterintelligence-related warrant for domestic spying. Would you not think the judges on this court would be furious by now? 
that they were played with the steel Russia dossier? Would you not think they would want to take steps? And they're free to take a lot. They have a lot of power. They can take steps themselves to get to the bottom of this. I think the judiciary in this case has been a disgrace. I think the FISA court has been a disgrace. I think the judges who've dealt with Mueller and his henchmen have been a disgrace. I think these courts have been an absolute disgrace. I really do. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Sad, isn't it? You listen to John Solomon and you say, now that guy is a journalist. How often do you say that? Almost never. I mean, there's enough here where investigative reporters at the New York Times, the Washington Post, the major networks, cable TV, they should all be on this stuff, but they're not, and they're not going to be. And they're not going to be. And that's why you know that journalism is dead. That's why you know that these so-called journalists are responsible for undermining the First Amendment and freedom of the press. Not anybody else. It is they. Because they pretend they're journalists. They're not journalists. They've bastardized their profession. You know, the holidays might be over, but obviously winter has just begun. And according to studies, the air indoors contains up to 100 times more pollution than the air outside. Because it can't diffuse anywhere. It's contained within your house or your apartment. This can cause illness, allergies, and unnecessary wear and tear on your HVAC system, leading to costly repairs or even worse, the premature replacement of the entire system. Have you replaced one of those? Six, seven, eight thousand dollars? Resolve to breathe better with filter by. Now what's filter by? Filter by is America's leading provider of HVAC filters for homes and small businesses. They carry over 600 different filter sizes, so they have one that fits your home, and some of you have filters of different sizes within your own home, and they include custom options if necessary. All ship for free, for free, within 24 hours. Plus, they're manufactured right here in America. It's a family business. Filter by offers a multitude of MERV options, all the way up to a hospital grade, so you'll be removing dangerous pollen, mold, dust, and other allergy aggravating pollution while maximizing the efficiency of your system. Right now, you can save 5% when you set up auto delivery. Now, what's that? Auto delivery ensures that you never need to think about air filters again. They come at the appropriate cycle. So you don't have to go to Home Depot or Lowe's or these other places and uh, look around and so forth. This comes, period. And you can order directly. 24-hour shipping. You pay nothing for shipping. Save money. Save time. Breathe better air with FilterBuy.com. That's FilterBuy.com. FilterBuy.com. Like all my wonderful sponsors, try it. Try it. Filterby.com. It's an outstanding service, and they have an outstanding product made here in the United States by a small American company. I think it's a great thing. I spoke to these people. They're very, very impressive. Adam, Bozeman, Montana, the great WBOZ. Go. Hi, Mark. Great to talk to you. KBOZ, uh, I apologize. Go right ahead. Yes, no, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, I was just thinking to myself in the last interview you had, you know, I go, yeah. Has the, any of these alphabet institutions ever been nonpartisan? I'm trying to think. Like these are these are human beings. How can they possibly not be partisan? And is it only now that we're finding out about it? Or well, first it- of all, first of all, you should at least, if you're a so-called journalist, strive to get the news and report the news. That's what you should do. Are you going to be perfect? No, but it should be your end game. That should be your goal. And uh, there used to be some journalists who did that, and we didn't know their politics and so forth and so on. But today they're very proud of, of, of their opinions, and you really cannot, I mean this honestly, you really cannot distinguish between the news and their opinions anymore. 
Understood, but I'm speaking more to like the FBI, the CIA, all these organizations. Have they always been nonpartisan? Is that just a pie in the sky thing to think about? They're nonpartisan. They have no feelings. They're not. Well, let me ask you: Do you think your local police are nonpartisan? For the most part, they are. Yes. So I I would argue that yes, for the most part, law enforcement is nonpartisan. Look, you don't join the FBI. Uh, out of college or out of law school or, out of, or, or as a CPA and so forth for the purpose of advancing politics. Okay, You join it because you're a patriot who wants to protect the nation, who wants to track down criminals. But the highest levels of the FBI is different. The FBI director goes through a completely different process to become the FBI director. The deputy director is extremely political to become the deputy uh, director. And these various assistant directors and associate directors, same thing. They're very, very, not all, but too many, very, very political. I'll tell you a guy who wasn't political, who was a great top-level FBI guy, Kallstrom. Kallstrom. He is and was terrific. Now, you can hold your political views, but you may not, cannot, must not allow it to influence the course of an investigation. And these guys apparently are very excited about it. They're tweeting each other. They're sending emails to each other. They're editing their statements. They're... They're all out for Hillary and against Trump. There's something horribly wrong about that. Let me ask you, though, how could they You've already asked not, enough. No, I can't, I can't, I don't have any more time. Nothing I said was going to resolve any of his questions, I can tell you that right now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back. He's here. He's here. Now broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello everybody, Mark Levin here, our number 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. Look folks... Last night, maybe the night before, a couple of weeks ago, I was pointing out to you that there's a mantra out there now about Donald Trump's mental fitness, that he's deranged, that he's demented. There's been a lot of talk about the 25th Amendment to the Constitution. Just so you know, though, this is an organized strategy. When you have phony people in the press, phony hosts on MSNBC, all sounding alike, saying the same thing. When you have a left-wing politician saying the same thing, you know it's being orchestrated. You know it's being orchestrated. Much of this guy Michael Wolff's book is about that, that uh, Trump is not fit for office, that there's something wrong with him. Not just that he's stupid and ignorant and blah, blah, blah. They make those allegations. But that he's mentally unstable. He's not very intellectual. He's not a deep thinker. He's not curious. Now, I want to tell you where this comes from in a moment. But first, let's listen to some of this, I'm afraid. Cut five, Mr. Producer. Go. So I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist, but it does. No, but you're a psycho. This is a left-wing kook Democrat, Ted Lieu, from California. Go ahead. So I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist, but it doesn't take a mental health professional to know that the president has said very disturbing things and acted in very disturbing ways. And whatever you may call that, he is not fit to be president. And I think we need to take steps to try to control what he could do in terms of harm to the United States. And this November, people can change the makeup of Congress to try to put more checks and balances on him. But I think we need to rise up as a nation and say, this is not normal. We need to stop this inappropriate behavior by the President of the United States. In terms of policy and actions, what's the inappropriate behavior by the President of the United States? We just spent an hour talking about the inappropriate behavior in the Obama administration the deranged, demented Obama administration, how they sold us out to the Iranians, how they sold us out to the Cubans, how they sold us out to the Chinese, to the Russians, and on and on and on. 
how they stick with Obamacare even though it's a failure. Talk about derangement and demented. Then we have uh, Richard Blumenthal, who I consider deranged and demented, as well as a serial pathological liar about his Vietnam service since he was never in the Vietnam War. Cut seven, go. Very clearly, the American public needs and deserves to know the physical and mental condition of the President of the United States. There may be certain parts of that condition that can be kept private, as has been done by previous presidents, but overall... The report should be released, as should be his tax returns, which have been the practice previously as well. This president has violated all the norms, and that really is deeply concerning. Now, who sounds mental and deranged? He does. But we know where this comes from. The Daily Caller points it out, but even Politico points it out. Uh, establishment media outlets, including CNN and MSNBC, writes Peter Hassan, have helped mainstream a conspiracy theory claiming that President Donald Trump is mentally ill. At the center of the conspiracy theory is Yale Psychiatry Associate Professor Bandy Lee, who for over a year has claimed that Trump is mentally impaired and unfit to serve, pointing out his tweets as evidence. During Trump's presidential campaign, Professor Lee flouted industry norms against publicly diagnosing a patient without his consent or in an in-person examination. She justified doing so on the grounds that she is, quote, obligated to break them in times of emergency, unquote. She continued her campaign after the election, earning a book deal in the process. Lee told New York Magazine in April last year that she was a pariah at her department because of her campaign against the president's mental health. I find that hard to believe at Yale. Which now includes the book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess a President. Lee's book, which came out October 3, argued that psychiatrists have a duty to warn the country about President Trump. So she's a whack job. Three days after Lee's book came out, the APA issued a statement reaffirming the importance of the Goldwater Rule, which instructs physicians not to provide professional opinions in the media about the mental health of someone they have not personally examined and without patient consent or other legal authority. The APA directly rebuked Lee's duty to warn argument. Quote, the APA would also like to dispel a common misconception about the so-called duty to warn. The duty to warn is a legal concept which varies from state to state, but which generally requires psychiatrists to breach the confidentiality of the therapeutic session when a risk of danger to others becomes known during treatment of the patient. It does not apply if there's no physician-patient relationship, the APA stated. Now, despite this rebuke, Democratic lawmakers have attempted to legitimize and promote the pariah professor's accusations. BuzzFeed, which is a left-wing kook operation, reported in October that six different Democrats in Congress reached out to Lee regarding her claims about Trump's mental health. Last month, Lee briefed a handful of congressional Democrats on her arguments over two days. Politico reported on Wednesday. Lee who has neither met nor examined Trump, told the Democratic congressman that the president is, quote, unraveling, unquote. Sounds like Joe Scarborough. And following the Politico report, establishment media outlets hyped Lee's allegation, which she has been making for over a year, as a new development. This guy, Brian Stelter at CNN, has been doing it. Endlessly. And I had printed out this piece from uh, Politico, I think two days ago, Uh, While I was on the air, it came out. Washington's growing obsession with the 25th Amendment. Lawmakers concerned about Trump's mental health invited a Yale psychiatry professor to brief them in in September. Lawmakers concerned about President Trump's mental state summoned Yale University psychiatry professor Dr. Brandy X. Lee to Capitol Hill last month for two days of briefings about her recent behavior. 
In an interview, she pointed to Trump, quote, going back to conspiracy theories, denying things he has admitted before, is being drawn to violent videos, Lee also warned. We feel that the rush of tweeting is an indication of his falling apart under stress. Trump is going to get worse and will become uncontainable with the pressures of the presidency. She was surprised by the interest in her findings during her two days in Washington. One senator said that it was the meeting he most looked forward to in 11 years. Now, that tells you how mentally deranged that guy is, or her. Their level of concern about the president's dangerousness was surprisingly high, she said. The conversation about Trump's fitness to serve is ongoing and gaining steam after Trump's tweet this week taunting the leader of North Korea with my nuclear button is bigger than yours, bravado. Now, I have put that to sleep. We remember what Reagan said we bomb in 10 minutes, meaning the Soviet Union. Will someone from his depleted and food-starved regime please inform him? Yeah, we know what he said. Politico writes that the tweet resuscitated the conversation about the president's mental state in the 25th Amendment, which allows for the removal of the president from office if the vice president and a majority of the cabinet deem him physically or mentally unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office. And the amendment is purposefully, they write, set up to require a high burden of proof. There's no evidence that Vice President Mike Pence or the majority of Trump's cabinet have turned on him. But Trump's Tuesday night nuclear taunt managed to cause alarm, even with his own party. Now, let's slow down here. I don't know how many more times I can say this. The 25th Amendment is defective. It's defective. Under ordinary impeachment procedures... A majority of the House of Representatives can vote to impeach a president. A supermajority or two-thirds of the Senate must vote to convict and remove a president. Under the 25th Amendment, two-thirds, not a majority, two-thirds of the House must vote. Not to impeach a president, but to find him... um, unable to serve in office under the 25th Amendment, and two-thirds of the Senate must vote as well. So it provides a higher vote requirement on the 25th Amendment than does pure impeachment. So the obsession with the 25th Amendment doesn't even make sense. However, it's really being used as a precursor to impeachment. They are throwing everything imaginable at this president that he's mentally deranged, that he's a great threat to the American people, that he's obstructed justice, that he was a sexual predator. I mean, what haven't they thrown at this guy? What haven't they thrown at him? And the media facilitate all of this. Professor Lee, in my humble opinion, is an unethical kook. And we're going to invite Professor Lee on this program to see if she'll come on this program. Why wouldn't she, unless she's a left-wing Democrat hack, as opposed to an objective professor? Why wouldn't she come on? I just want to ask you some questions. That's all. I'll be absolutely professional and polite. Unlike her, what she's doing is highly unprofessional. So we have this professor, associate professor, I believe, from Yale, professor of psychiatry, who puts out these statements, puts out these arguments, has participated in writing this book. The Democrats in Congress, many of them, embrace her and regurgitate her claims. And then certain media figures with very low IQs, Joe Scarborough, Brian Stelter, others, keep repeating it. Doesn't this prove? Prove that, that, that Trump has a mental question. Isn't this true? You know, I, when I was at Towson State, this is what we learned at Towson State. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, we know all about this stuff. And Joe Scarborough, a complete loser, Mister Deliverance Boy. But they all keep repeating this. That's what's called propaganda. Over and over, the big lie. And they're using this, in my view, highly unethical uh, professor of psychiatry at Yale University to do it. And again, the media just love it. And this clown's book, 
What's his name again, Mr. Producer? Michael Wolf. Michael Wolf. As I understand it, much of the substance of this book has to deal with Trump's unfitness for office. Now, this was never said of Joe Biden, who is a complete nut job. I even hear Republicans now on my favorite cable channel, Fox, which I'll be joining in a few weeks. Month. Two months. Joe Biden is widely liked, even by Democrats, Republicans. No, he's widely despised as a man who did a a horrific character assassination of Bob Bork, horrific character assassination of Clarence Thomas, dumbest guy in law school, had to cheat, had to lie about it, dumbest candidate ever, has to steal stuff from a from a Labour Party uh, candidate in Britain because he can't come up with his own arguments. Wrong about everything. Wrong about everything. And particularly in foreign policy, his supposed expertise. Never right. Nobody ever said, that guy is mentally unstable. Nobody ever said Keith X, a.k.a. Keith Ellison, is mentally unstable, demented, deranged, despite his long history of anti-Semitism and kook conspiracies? No. But Donald Trump, you see, this is a campaign. It is insidious. It is invidious. It's poisonous to the body politic. But they don't care on the left. They throw you in prison if they can. They'll, they'll impeach you, remove you from office if they can. They'll have you sent to a mental institution if they can. And by the way, they think of you exactly the same way. The deplorables or these right-wing nuts or reactionaries and that sort of, they, they just despise half of this country. Hate it. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Now, ladies and gentlemen, where uh, reporters at the White House are asking the press secretary, uh, Huckabee, Huckabee Sanders, I guess, they're now asking her uh, if the uh, president, what is he, what, what do you think about the statements about the president's mental health? What, what do you think about all that stuff? It's incredible. It's incredible what Democrat presidents get away with, which is almost everything and anything. And yet we have this. And yet we have this. Let's go to Rich, Westchester, New York, the great WABC. Go. Hi, Mark. Thank you for taking my call. All right. You said earlier journalism's dead. It's also dead from the conservative news agencies. Um, two examples of this right now are the prolific reporting of the stock market gains and the low unemployment rate. Um, during Obama's administration, the stock market doubled from 10 to 20,000, but this wasn't touted uh, by Fox News as a major indicator of our economy's well-being. Wow, you caught us! Wow! Well, then how did you know about it, sir? How did I... I, I remember what I hear and see. No, but how, well, who'd you hear it and see it? Where'd you hear it from and where'd you see it? See what? Do you watch the Fox Business Channel? No, I don't watch it. I need to know what you're referring to, Mark. You're saying- no, I'm referring to what you said, that the, that the uh, stock market went up under Obama. I asked you if you watched the Fox Business Channel. Well, they... they, they so I, they reported it every damn day. Where were you? You were on MSNBC. No, I wasn't. I watched Fox News all the time, Mark. I said, did you watch the Fox Business Channel? I watch it occasionally. Well, you apparently didn't watch it much. Why? What's your, what's your next uh, bit of evidence, sir? Oh, okay. Uh, when the unemployment rate was dropping under Obama, Trump called these figures fake. Fox News kept reporting how Obama's unemployment figures don't reflect... Why did you have to write this looking? down? Why, finish, why did you... Can... I'm going to let you finish, pal. But I'm going to expose you. Why are you writing this down and reading from it? Who says I'm writing it down and reading it? I can tell you're reading it. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, pal. Okay, pal. Since Trump took office, Fox removed that metric. All right, sir, I I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know why you're obsessed with Fox. 
No, you know, you don't have to watch Fox. Apparently, you don't. Watch your friends at MSLSD or CNN or watch the airport radar or watch sonograms or watch your feet for all I care. Obama dragged this economy into the crapper. We couldn't grow up past 3%. Notice she didn't bring that up. Notice she didn't bring up he added $10 trillion in debt. Notice she didn't bring that up. Notice she didn't bring up all the massive regulations he put in place. I'll be right back. Conservatism with passion. The Mark Levin Show. Call in now. 877-381-3811. We're working on trying to get a few, a couple of guests, irregular you might call them, right, Mr. Producer? Who typically, uh, that's what I would call them, who, who probably wouldn't want to come on this show, so I'm not going to announce who we're trying to get. Because the little leftists out there will tip, don't go on that show, don't go on that show. But we're going to try and get a few of them. It's not about ratings, it's about telling the truth. I don't need them for ratings. I want them to explore things with them. Right, Rich? So we'll see if we can get that done. If we can't, I'll tell you who we've tried to get. You know, when I wrote the Liberty Amendments, it's because I knew regardless of who's running Washington, the only way to fix the country and restore its founding principles was to call a convention of states. I had no idea that my friend Mark Meckler was actually launching a project to do just that at the same exact time. And today I'm honored to have served on their legal advisory board since the very beginning. Just four years later, over three million people are involved. Twelve states have already passed the Convention of States Resolution. By the way, that's more than 20%. And we're on our way to calling the first Article 5 Convention of States in American history. It's a meeting of the states. States get together, they send a a few delegates from each state, the rules are agreed to in advance. Mark, what about a runaway convention? I don't understand this. Since it still takes 38 state legislatures or conventions in the states to ratify an amendment, how could it be a runaway convention? They're proposing amendments to the states, to themselves. You want to see a runaway convention? Look at Congress. You want to see a runaway convention? Look at the courts. You want to see a runaway convention? Look at the bureaucracy. They're changing our country. They're changing our Constitution. They're rewriting it all the time. Now, some of you say, I'm an originalist. Really? And I hear this from some of these think tanks, like over at the Heritage Foundation, and say, well, I'm an originalist. (laughs) Really? Well, then, don't you believe in Article 5, Convention of States? It's in there. Or do you write that off? Well, if you write it off, you write it out, you're a liberal. You say you're for the Tenth Amendment. You say you're for federalism. And the only way to actually institutionalize that is to exercise that power under Article 5. Now, Article 5. The people are going to propose and ratify amendments to restrain the scope and power of the federal government. And that's the problem, really, that people have with this. Because it's effective. So what's your New Year's resolution? How about resolving to do something that will really matter? If you care about the future of our nation like I do, then please go to conventionofstates.com. Conventionofstates.com. Sign the petition and volunteer today. This is what the real patriots are doing. I'm all in. But the future of the nation depends on each one of you. And I'm depending on each one of you. Mark, what can we do? This is what you can do. It is the only solution as big as the nation's problems. Conventionofstates.com. Conventionofstates.com. Well, yes. Kevin, uh, Silver City, North Carolina, Sirius Satellite. How are you, sir? I am doing wonderful, and I love your show. Thank you. Thank you. Go for it, baby. Hey, listen, man. I, I, as I told the guy, listen, I don't just hope they lock up Hillary. I want them to go get Obama, too. Because oh, anytime geez. you mess with my health insurance, my wife is on disability. She mm-hmm. lost a perfectly good doctor in behind your so-called, uh, uh, I, 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 I just believe my plan is, uh, is a better plan. And 
And, and I just think that we're going to do better with Obamacare. Yeah, we did better. We went better down in the gutter. Not only did we lose good health insurance coverage, we lost good doctors. We lost any chance of having a good doctor. And, and then you raised my taxes through the roof. But I'm supposed to support you because I'm a black man? Man, go somewhere. Go back to Africa. No, 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 no. Don't say that. Don't say that. Uh, but I get your other point, which is, and, and, and he is, he's treated like this hero, and he's protected by the media. And all these problems that have occurred with Obamacare, they were all predicted. All of them predicted. It was common sense. But you see, Kevin, this is the way the left operates. They are ideologues. They are progressives. They are not going to take a step back. Their answer to this is not to get rid of Obamacare, but to, quote, unquote, improve it, expand it, put more money into it, compel more, more uh, uh, people to participate in it, more mandates. This is how they plan to get to where they're going, which is a disaster. Mark, it was a disaster to put him in office to start with. Not trying to be funny or anything, but any man that can win a, that can win his election off of Facebook, I mean, should we have really taken that serious? Because well. here's, my thing. here's my thing, Mark. I was sold into the Democratic Party for years because my parents, my grandparents, my family were all were all Democrats. I had no earthly idea why I was a Democrat. I was just a Democrat because everybody else was. But when I started buying into American, the real American history and what re- America really stands for, it's not about how white you are, how black you are. It's about being it's the red, white, and blue for real. And, and, and when a man tells me he wants to support the stopping of mass murdering of babies, the stopping the mass the, the mass taxes that's going on, uh, ending the fact that a, a person that's on disability does not have to fight to find a doctor, but you can get good coverage again, and you can go to your own doctor, and you can be seen. And, and, and not only that, but you can say what you want to about Donald Trump, but if we're going to talk about people in the past that have messed up, we can go all the way back to the Bible days and look at David, Solomon, and all of the rest of them. But we forgave those people. So now if we're really going to be forgivers of people who mess up, then let's go ahead and start here. Now, I forgive Obama. He's out of office. I forgive him. I just don't want him to run for office again. Mm-hmm. All right, Kevin. I appreciate it. God bless, sir. When you think about how many people have been harmed by Obamacare, all we get is the usual propaganda. How many people have been thrown off of health care, and we find out that the vast majority of them haven't been thrown off of anything? They didn't want to pay the mandate, the fee, the penalty. Excuse me, the amount, so they were paying the penalty instead. You talk about a constitutional convention. What do you think John Roberts did on the Supreme Court? He led, in essence, a constitutional convention that destroyed our health care system by rewriting the legislative history behind Obamacare. He's a disgrace, and he'll never recover from that. It's one of the greatest acts of judicial activism in American history. I, my family, spends an enormous amount of time dealing with the healthcare bureaucracy. All the letters that come, all the reports that come, it is endless. The deductibles are enormous. Obama created this. The left created this. And if they can do more, they're going to do more. They're going to do more. What do you think? Hillary Clinton invented her own health care system, remember? And hers was so Soviet-like that even if you had the desire to purchase private health care outside of the Hillary care that she wanted to create, you would be prevented as a matter of federal law from doing so. That day, unfortunately, is coming because the Republican Senate failed to fully repeal Obamacare, as did the House. Oh, I know the pom-poms and the rockets are all out there telling us how great they are. They're not great. McConnell's not great. Let me tell you something. I saw a piece the other day where McConnell's all excited about Bannon's downfall and he's dancing on his grave. And so let me tell this jerk McConnell something. There are millions of us who cannot stand you. Millions of us. Millions of us who want to see you leave. We don't buy into all the phony surrogate media that tells us without McConnell we wouldn't have Gorsuch. Of course we would. Well, without McConnell we wouldn't have tax reform. Of course we would. But without McConnell we might actually have the damn Obamacare repealed. 
among many other things. Oh, they're very excited now, the establishment. What the establishment doesn't understand, and that's okay by me, this was never a nationalist populist movement. It is a conservative movement. It's the old Tea Party movement. It's the old Reagan revolution. We haven't gone anywhere. We're still alive. We're still here. So are our children and our grandchildren. It's not a new ideology. It's a very old philosophy. It's as old as mankind. And we are battling this progressive ideology, whether practiced by the Democrats or practiced by the Republicans. You listen to Kevin. You know, people are suffering as a result of these policies, and you never hear it. Instead, you get Mumbler, Bumbler, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, some other, uh, you know, lightweight telling us about all the people who are going to be harmed if we do the right thing. People are being harmed right now as a result of these policies. All right, let's go. Earl, Los Angeles, California, Sirius Satellite, a psychiatrist. Go. Hey, Mark. Uh, first time caller, long time listener. How's it going? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good. Very well. I, I read the report by that uh, Yale psychiatrist. And you know what? As a psychiatrist, uh, I think it's a disservice to those who actually suffer from mental illness. Mm -hmm. And it's a violation of the ethical rule that we as psychiatrists have to follow called the Goldwater Rule. And as long as you cannot diagnose any form of mental illness in someone you haven't examined. Yeah, she's a disgrace, and of course she's yeah. being exploited, and she wants to be exploited by the Democrat Party and the media. And to have a question like this asked of the president's press secretary, it just shows you how diabolical this is. Absolutely. And but and the Goldwater Rule is it named after Barry Goldwater? What what does that mean? The Goldwater yeah, Rule. Yeah, back uh, when uh, Barry Goldwater was running for president, uh, there was a bunch of psychiatrists who had written up a letter. Uh, claiming what you know, what psychiatrists are now doing for Donald Trump is uh, trying to put him out as someone who's suffering from mental illness when he, when they haven't examined him at all. And so what the APA did was to come up with this ethical rule saying that the no psychiatrist should not diagnose any form of mental illness unless the patient has actually been examined. Well, how does this woman still have a license? Uh, it, it shocks me and. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure of why she's still practicing as a psychiatrist. Oh, it's worse than that. She's a professor. She's teaching. Yeah. In an academic institution, teaching other doctors who train to be psychiatrists. I mean, Yale University, well, you know, one of the great Ivy League schools of America, sounds like a well, crackpot, this me. woman, to me. Yeah, absolutely. All right, sir. Thank you for your call. Much appreciated. I shall return. Much love in. A little research during the break. In an issue, September to October 1964, of a magazine called Fact. They surveyed a bunch of psychiatrists, and the magazine cover reported back then, 1,189 psychiatrists say Goldwater is psychologically unfit to be president. Now, he was psychologically unfit to be president because he was an unequivocal conservative. So he faced the wrath of the liberal left, the left wing, in the media and academia. So 53 years ago, the same damn thing was going on. And after the election, Goldwater sued the publisher of this magazine for defamation, and he won. And he was awarded $75,000 in punitive damages, which was a lot over half a century ago. The magazine eventually folded. The politicization of professions in order to attack conservatives, or let me put it this way, non-progressives. Since the New Deal, since really the progressive movement of the early 1900s, late 1800s, knows no bounds. So now the same thing's being done to Donald Trump, that he is mentally unstable, 
But we have a psychiatrist from Yale who insists on it in violation of the so-called Goldwater Rule. And that's where the, uh, the, the Association of uh, Psychiatrists said, you can't do this. You've got to stop this. You're undermining our profession. And there are really people out there who have mental health issues. And look what you're doing. You're politicizing this. Which is exactly what Professor Lee, Brian Stelter, and all the rest have done and are doing. You know, ladies and gentlemen, 2018 is here, and it's time to look your best. That's right. Look younger than you ever have in years. Guaranteed. It's easy with a brand new Genesel treatment for droopy eyelids. Mary from Fort Collins, Colorado wrote, I don't believe everything I hear. So I tried this eye lift on my right eye, and the next day at work, everybody said my right eye looked better. I couldn't believe it. Yes, all the saggy lines on your eyelids disappear. This breakthrough eyelid treatment is yours free with your order of Genesel for bags and puffiness. Plus, you'll also get Genesel immediate effects for 12-hour results. Go to Genesel.com, that's Genesel.com, or better yet, give them a call, 800-SKIN-604, 800-SKIN-604. It gets better. Order in the next 20 minutes to get two more classics, Esoteek RF Collagen Builder and Deep Firming Serum, free. Now, during Chaminade's amazing New Year's sale, you'll get the best-selling Lason's Neck Treatment. My buddy Teddy heard this. And he jumped in the front of the line. He couldn't call fast enough. Call now and upgrade to Express Shipping Free. That's six free gifts. 800 Skin 604. Harry, supplies are running out. Call 800 Skin 604. 800 Skin 604. Or go to Genesel.com. And they have wonderful customer service there. Wonderful customer service. You should really check them out. The unethical activity that is taking place among the media, so-called journalists, among psychiatrists, and there's others, I've been looking during the break at that too, uh, is really unbelievable. Among lawyers claiming that Trump has committed impeachable offenses. Just look at this. Look at what an absolute disgrace it is. But look at how all these power positions, all these professions are controlled by the progressive left. I don't care what profession you look at. Controlled by the progressive left. Entertainment, controlled by the progressive left. Is there a single conservative late-night comic, Mr. Producer? Is there one? Is there an out-of-closet conservative late-night comic? They exist. But are they on any of the network shows? No, they're not. Well, why is that? Is there a single conservative host of a Sunday talk show. Two of them work for Democrat senators. Todd and, in the case of Stephanopoulos, uh, correction, he worked for Democrat president. Now think about that. And when you look at the media across the board, the Washington Post is reliable, Left wing. New York Times, reliable. Left wing. Look at our universities and colleges. You can count the number of actual conservative universities and colleges, if you're not counting religious institutions, on one hand. Maybe on two or three fingers. That's it. Look at the film studios, which used to be controlled by conservatives when they were actually founded. Is there a single one controlled by a conservative? Disney? No. Look at the new media. Netflix? Leftists. I'll be right back. He's here. He's here. Now broadcasting from the underground command post... Deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, everybody.
everybody. Mark Levin here. Our final hour of the program on this Friday where the federal government is shut down. And America cheers. Our number, 877-381-3811. 877-381-3811. Where two-thirds of the country is suffering from global warming. As the temperature keeps rising. As a result of human beings. Oh. Is that not the case anymore? I mean climate change. All right, folks, I saved this for hour three because that's where it belongs. The New York Slimes is out there with another phony story. Now, the New York Slimes hasn't broken a single story uh, on uh, veiling, on uh, revealing uh, Hillary Clinton in Uranium One. The New York Slimes pushed this collusion story as far as it could, then it tried to uh, circle back and push another phony story that some junior lightweight former staffer to the campaign who was drunk spoke to an Australian diplomat who then informed the FBI, you see, that uh, that the, uh, the Trump campaign was trying to get information from the Russians. Oh, wait a minute. I thought it was Fusion GPS. No, 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 forget about all that. We've moved on. The New York Slimes has shown absolutely no interest in domestic political espionage by the Obama administration. The New York Times has shown absolutely no interest in James Comey's political activities in uh, clearing Hillary Clinton before the investigation was even completed or she was interviewed and the multiple iterations of his draft memo. No interest whatsoever. New York Slimes has shown very little interest in the real scandals that have taken place in this country, but they try to create them because the New York Slimes knows that when it writes something, The fools at CNN, the fools at MSNBC, the fools at NBC, the fools at CBS, the fools at ABC, the fools in most of radio, outside of conservative radio, just the fools generally with microphones and TV cameras and writing pens, yes, they will regurgitate it. So if the New York Slimes, during the height of World War II, does its very best to conceal the fact of the Holocaust while the media follows along, they do the same thing. As they did. I'll be the one to remind them to the end of my life of what they did during World War II. That newspaper should have gone out of business. That newspaper should have been shamed. That newspaper should have been repudiated. Instead, fools like Scarborough, fools like Stetler who used to work there, fools throughout the phony media, phony profession, cite the New York Times. Holocaust deniers. All right, here's the New York Slimes with a story last evening. Obstruction inquiry shows Trump struggled to keep grip on Russia investigation. Obstruction inquiry shows Trump struggled to keep grip on Russia investigation. So the suggestion in the headline is Trump's a target of an obstruction investigation. And knowing Mueller, who knows? But he's trying to keep his grip on the Russian investigation. He was never going to keep his grip on the Russian investigation, whether the investigation occurred through Maine Justice under Jeff Sessions and the criminal division or from a U.S. attorney. It doesn't work that way. And Michael Schmidt of the New York Slime should know better, but he doesn't care. He's a propagandist. Let's begin this story, shall we? President Trump gave firm instructions in March to the White House's top lawyer, stop the Attorney General Jeff Sessions from recusing himself in the Justice Department's investigation into whether Mr. Trump's associates had helped a Russian campaign to disrupt the 2016 election. All right, let's stop there. Did it work? Wow, those are some instructions. By the way, what if it had worked? Was that obstruction? Of course it's not obstruction. You're not obstructing an investigation because you don't want your attorney general to recuse himself. He didn't direct his attorney general not to investigate, which he could do, by the way, as well, and it's not obstruction. But he never even did it. But let's go on. Public pressure was building for Mr. Sessions, meaning Democrats in Congress, phony Praetorian Guard journalists, they were the ones building the pressure on Mr. Sessions, who'd been a senior member of the Trump campaign, to step aside. That the White House counsel, Donald F. McGahn II, 
carried out the president's orders and lobbied Mr. Sessions to remain in charge of the inquiry, according to two people with knowledge of the episode. So here we have leaking from the White House again. I can certainly guess who one of them is, but I won't say so. But look how it's written like intrigue. The White House counsel, McGahn, carried out the president's orders. Mr. Peters, did they call him White House counsel? Is the White House counsel the lawyer for the president? So the president, allegedly, asks him to tell Sessions not to recuse. And there's some problem with this? The president asks his White House lawyer to tell his attorney, don't recuse yourself, you handle this investigation. Or we might have a runaway nut like Mueller, which of course is true. Is there a problem with this? Mr. McGahn was unsuccessful. The president erupted in anger in front of numerous White House officials. Remember that picture, Mr. Producer, where they had a picture through the Oval Office window where the president was very angry with McGahn? Remember that? You do? You you, you with me? You, you awake? All right, good. Just want to make sure. And remember who one of the other people was in that window? Who was it? Bannon was one of them, right? Just pointing that out. McGahn was unsuccessful, and the president erupted in anger in front of numerous White House officials, saying he needed his attorney general to protect him. Mr. Trump said he had expected his top law enforcement official to safeguard him the way he believed Robert Kennedy, as attorney general, had done for his brother, John Kennedy, and Eric Holder had done for Barack Obama. Well, that's certainly true. That's certainly true. And by the way, what is Trump accused of? Let's go back to the time that this supposedly happened. Trump didn't do anything. There wasn't a special counsel appointed to investigate Donald Trump. But Trump, like you and me and you and you and everybody else, you know what special counsel do. There's no legal issue here, folks. There's no ethical issue here. There's no obstruction issue here. None. Mr. Trump then asked, where's my Roy Cohn? He was referring to his former personal lawyer and fixer who'd been Senator Joseph McCarthy's top aide during investigations into communist activity in the 50s and who died in 1986. Again, let's just stop. What does this have to do with anything? His reference to Roy Cohn. What does that have to do with anything? Nothing. Why are the liberal media upset when this president refers to Robert Kennedy protecting John Kennedy when that's exactly what happened? Or Eric Holder protecting Barack Obama when that's exactly what happened? Do they deny it? The lobbying of Mr. Sessions is one of several previously unreported episodes that the special counsel Robert S. Mueller III has learned about. Well, how does this get to the New York Slimes unless somebody in Robert S. Mueller III's office is leaking it, including Robert S. Mueller III? Has learned about as he investigates whether Mr. Trump obstructed the FBI's Russia inquiry. Well, how did he obstruct the FBI's Russia inquiry? But folks, here's the nefarious part of this. Read the New York Times not for facts. Read the New York Times, not for news. Read the New York Times to know what Mr. Mueller is up to. Mr. Mueller is putting together a phony, circumstantial case for impeachment. We've talked about this over and over and over again. That's why Schumer today said, we will protect Mueller under every circumstance and for every reason. Schumer's close to Mueller. Schumer's former U.S. attorney, who used to be the U.S. attorney in Manhattan, is one of Mueller's buddies. Schumer's close to Comey, one of Mueller's buddies. This is an incestuous, revolting, repulsive, unconscionable situation. Yes, Mr. Mueller has learned about this, you see, the, whether there's been obstruction. The events occurred during a two-month period from when Mr. Sessions recused himself in March till the appointment of Mr. Mueller in May when Mr. Trump believed he was losing control over the investigation. 
Mr. Trump never had control over the investigation, you idiots. He's not in charge of the investigation. He wasn't conducting the investigation. He would not be responsible for conducting the investigation. He's the President of the United States. You know, under this theory, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States should have nothing to do with the Department of Justice, ever. Every investigation can be said to be tainted because he has his political appointees over there, starting with Jeff Sessions. Every single one. Well, we have an investigation of Hillary. At tainted. Well, we have an investigation of Holder. At tainted. We have an investigation of Democrats on the At tainted. I mean, under this theory, any time there's a Republican president, they, you could not have a legitimate, ethical, nonpartisan, relatively objective criminal investigation of anyone who's a Democrat. Among other episodes, Mr. Trump described the Russia investigation as fabricated. Now, here's where you have, this is, this is where we don't get news. This is where we get opinion now. So they're trying to muscle up this, this phony obstruction allegation, which there it doesn't even exist except among the Democrats and the journalists. Among the other episodes, Mr. Trump described the Russia investigation as fabricated and politically motivated. Yes. In a letter that he intended to send to the FBI director at the time, James Comey. But that White House aide stopped him from sending. Now look, there is one or two or three disgruntled White House aides or former aides who are leaking to the New York Times. If I were running a committee of Congress, I'd drag all their asses up on Capitol Hill. I'd put them under oath under penalty of perjury and I'd ask them if they've been making these leaks against the President of the United States. Yes, a process crime. I have instinctively uh, a view of who is doing most of this leaking. Now, this appears to be somebody with an axe to grind. Maybe there's many of them who have axes to grind. I don't know. But this is all inside baseball that's being poured out to the New York Times for the purpose of doing maximum damage to this president. Mr. Mueller has also substantiated claims that Mr. Comey made in a series of memos describing troubling interactions with the president before he was fired in May. Now, how would Mr. Mueller substantiate those claims unless he relies on Jim Comey? Moreover, why is this information in the New York Times? It can only be in the New York Times if Mr. Mueller is leaking it. Congress ought to drag Mr. Mueller's ass up there. Not to interfere with his precious investigation, but to ask him questions about his ethics and put him under oath. Now look, look at the details. The special counsel has received handwritten notes from Mr. Trump's former chief of staff, Rince Priebus, showing that Mr. Trump talked to Mr. Priebus about how he had called Mr. Comey to urge him to say publicly that he was not under investigation. We've talked about that. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that, because Mr. Comey and others left the impression that he was under investigation when he wasn't under investigation. How is that obstruction? Trump is the victim in that case. The president's determination to fire Mr. Comey even led one White House lawyer to take the extraordinary step of misleading Mr. Trump about whether he had the authority to remove him. Where does that come from? What, what is this? New York Times has also learned that four days before Mr. Comey was fired, one of Mr. Sessions' aides asked a congressional staff member whether he had damaging information about Mr. Comey, part of an apparent effort to undermine the FBI director. Listen, listen, New York Slimes, the FBI director has undermined himself. He was leaking memos to you through a go-between, a law professor. Not clear whether Mr. Mueller's investigators knew about this episode. And it goes on. Legal experts said that of the two primary issues Mr. Mueller appears to be investigating, whether Mr. Trump investi- uh, obstructed justice while in office. Will somebody please tell me how Mr. Trump obstructed justice? Is Mr. Mueller still investigating? Yes. Has Mr. Mueller hired everybody he's wanted to hire from the Hillary and the Obama campaigns? Yes. Does Mr. Mueller get the budget that he wants? Yes. Is Mr. Mueller freely leaking to the media and his staff freely leaking to the media? 
Yes. Can somebody show me where there's actual obstruction taking place? Just show it to me. Where is it? Where is it? But the experts are divided about whether the accumulated evidence is enough for Mr. Mueller to bring an obstruction case. They said it could be difficult to prove that the president, who has broad authority over the executive branch, including the hiring and firing officials, had corrupt intentions when he took actions like ousting the FBI director. So now ousting the FBI director in the course, not even of a real investigation, of a nascent investigation, is obstruction of justice? If the president of the United States fires a subordinate, it's obstruction of justice? Some experts said the case would be stronger if there was evidence that the president had told witnesses to lie under oath. How would the president tell witnesses to lie under oath when we don't even know anymore what Mueller is actually investigating? In fact, did not the president say that Mr. Mueller should follow his leads and if any of his subordinates broke the law, then deal with it? How come that is not in this article? The accounts of the episodes are based on documents reviewed by the Times, as well as interviews with White House officials and others briefed on the investigation. So you have certain people who worked for the White House who are leaking, and you have investigators who are leaking to the New York Times. Now let me ask you something. If the purpose here is justice, who's obstructing justice? Mr. Mueller, the New York Times, and the leakers. They're the ones obstructing justice. I'll be right back. Mark Levin. I think if we could sit in on deliberations by Mueller and his staff of radical leftists, I think we would be absolutely appalled at what they discuss, how they discuss it, their tactics, their strategies, what their end game is. We learn, we have learned so much about how Comey ran the FBI. And the fact that this guy is best friends with Mueller should scare the hell out of each and every one of you. Comey went rogue. Comey was an egomaniac, still is. Comey decided to leak memoranda to the media of notes he took of the President of the United States. Not because they proved a damn thing, but because he wanted to stir the pot there was a reason why it was leaked to the New York Times, there was a reason why he didn't do it directly, because he's a coward who would have gotten caught, prosecuted for perjury if he didn't confess in his own self-aggrandizing way. And rather than be condemned for what he has done, being condemned for for the politicization at the highest levels of the FBI, he's held out as an exemplar. And Mr. Mueller is busy chasing tails. I'll be right back. A champion of freedom. You know, you're one of the greatest champions of freedom in this country, if not in the English-speaking world, Mark. Call Mark at 877-381-3811. There's the great vice president, Mike Pence. If you're starting off this new year with some resolutions, may I suggest one that we should all try? Stop watching fake news. Last year, we saw how far the lib media will go, even at the expense of their credibility. If you missed the last couple Levin TV episodes of the year, we recapped the Obama surveillance scandal. You know, the one that the New York Slimes, Washington Compost, CNN, MSNBC, NBC, ABC, CBS, and the rest have ignored. It started with total mockery of yours truly by the media, ended with total vindication. Now, these are the kinds of stories you're only going to get on CRTV. We're bringing you the truth night in and night out. 2018 is shaping up to be a huge year for CRTV. We're adding new shows from hosts like Andrew Wilkow, Ali Stuckey, and much, much more. Plus, the price is less than 8 bucks a month when you use promo code LEVIN. That's L-E-V-I-N. Folks, it's time to fight back against the liberal media. There are alternative 
sources of information. Do yourself a favor. Try CRTV for a week, completely free. That's right. For a week, completely free at CRTV.com. Make sure you use code LEVIN, that's code L-E-V-I-N, and that way you take $10 off your annual subscription. Sign up right now, CRTV.com, or even better yet, we have a toll-free number, 844-LEVIN-TV, 844-L-E-V-I-N-TV. Now, I know the government is shut down. We never shut down. We never shut down here. We never shut down on Levin TV. They're right there, our wonderful customer relations folks. They'll tell you how to set it all up. You'll have it all done in time to watch Levin TV tonight, which is a great Levin TV. 844-LEVIN-TV. That's 844-L-E-V-I-N-TV. Well, let's hear what some of you have to say, shall we? Yes. Jim. San Francisco, California, the great KSFO. Go. Hi, Mark. Got a quick question for you. Uh, yes. New, York Times versus, New York Times versus Sullivan. Um, mm-hmm. Let me tell you why I'm calling. <clears throat> uh, about a year or so ago, I read a book by George Orwell called Homage to Catalonia, uh, which is about his experiences during the Spanish Civil War, which was really a power struggle among a congeries of left-wing parties. The communists were fighting his party. He said that all over Western Europe, they were fighting with fake news. He didn't use that phrase, but that's what he was talking about, Mm -hmm. except in England. In England, they didn't dare do that because England had a libel law. Mm -hmm. In New York Times versus Sullivan, as I understand it, the -hmm. Supreme Court basically wiped out American libel law. It seems to me that... No, 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 let's... Up, 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 up. That case dealt with uh, mostly uh, public official types, right? But, but, but still... There, there is still libel law in this country. I understand that. But my point is, uh, this recent... They made it much more difficult to sue successfully public officials or public figures and made it much more difficult um, for them to sue uh, so-called news outlets or outlets of any kind, um, if that's what you're saying. Yes, but I I think that if New York Times versus Sullivan hadn't been decided, I think the Hules camp situation of a year or two ago wouldn't have occurred, and I think a lot of what was published or is apparently- I know, sir, maybe so, but we have this First Amendment. It's in our Constitution. They don't have that in the U.K. They don't even have a Constitution. I understand that, but we had libel law. There's a difference between... We still have libel law in this country. I, I understand. It's I'm- still... No, you don't understand. You just keep talking over me. We still have libel law in this country. However, <clears throat> in cases that involve public officials or public figures... And there's a whole complex process you go through to determine if people uh, fit into those categories. It is a much, much higher bar. But if somebody calls you a horrific name and you're not that, and they, <clears throat> you can still sue them and you can win. And people do. Right. All right. Great. Thanks for your call. All right. Not sure what that's all about. Let's go to Ted, Rockville, Maryland, the great WMAL. Go. Yes, sir. Um, I'm a couple of years younger than you. I graduated college in the early 80s. And back then, when you took a journalism class, they used to teach two mantras. And it goes like this, that reporters were supposed to be the eyes and ears of we, the people, not eyes and ears of the Democrats or eyes and ears of Mitch McConnell, it was used as a phrase, eyes and ears of we, the people, to protect us from a rogue government. And the way they did that was by staying on top of the day-to-day governing of these politicians, and you never dared, at least if you wanted a reputation, you were taught you wouldn't publish an article without validating it through what? Two independent sources. 
Maybe if it was a serious I, I, matter. I would, I would suggest to you that the media has been going downhill for at least half a century. I mean, you had propagandists for Stalin uh, at the New York Times who got uh, Pulitzer Prizes and so forth. You had uh, propagandists for the, uh, for the communists in this country. And you're propagandists right now for the progressive movement in this country. The fact of the matter is that these journalists, so-called, all believe that their role is to advance the call of, cause of progressivism. They right. believe progressivism promotes civil rights. They believe progressivism promotes egalitarianism. They believe progressivism is humanism uh, because uh, this is what they're taught. This is how they're indoctrinated, and they are now very aggressively promoting this through this profession that they, are, they have and are continuing to destroy. Correct. They don't and even that, they don't even understand what progressivism is. That's correct, and and the sad part is, Mark, the the Republicans aren't willing to stand up and fight because it's almost like they're rolling over. Well, a lot of them agree with progressivism, and I'll tell you what, a lot of them would love nothing more than Donald Trump to be taken out. And my problem, my problem is, is that politically, pe- people need to understand that the media, whoever controls the media, can control people's opinions especially if they're uneducated it's almost like when you fight a battle it's 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 it's, if you control the culture you control the media if you control the culture you control the classroom if you control the culture you control the courts if you control the culture you control the bureaucracy if you control the culture you control politics i mean that's the bottom line this progressivism uh is a is an ideology a very successful ideology in terms of conquering liberty, in terms of conquering uh, uh, more legitimate philosophies. It is a tyrannical mindset in the end. And I've called progressivism the bastard child of Marxism because that's exactly what it is. You, you You have people running around as Marxists, whether it's Black Lives Matter or... Uh, leftist organizations un- unrelated to race and so forth, Antifa is a perfect example, promoting Marxism and trashing uh, America and trashing America's history. They talk about slaveholders, right? That's how they trash George Washington and, uh, and the rest of them. And it's interesting, though, because under Marxism, estimates go as high as 100 million people have been slaughtered in the name of that ideology. 100 million people. Now, they can stand there and point to George Washington, which is really an abuse. But they are they are carrying on, carrying the flag of the most horrific genocidal ideology man has ever concocted. All right, Ted, I appreciate your call. Thank you, sir. Let's take another, shall we? Kevin, Columbia, South Carolina, the great WVOC. Go. Hey, Mark. Uh... You're doing a great job up there. You really, you really uh, go a long way to straighten out some of the uh, confusing uh, BS you. the mainstream media puts out there. Thank uh, you, sir. And uh, I, I think Trump, Trump made a mistake. He should have fired the first ten layers over there at the FBI and Justice Department the first day he came into office. He should have done what? He should have fired the first top, the top ten layers in the. FBI and the, and the Justice Department the first day he went into office. Well, maybe so, but the truth is Obama should have fired Comey a long time ago, but he yeah, didn't he have should've. the guts to do it. You know, they talked about it, he and Valerie Jarrett and the other uh, the others in that cabal, but they didn't do it. Yeah, if he could. And you know fired. what? If he if he had fired Comey back then, he would have been hailed by Hillary Clinton, hailed by Schumer, hailed by Schiff, hailed by all these lousy, good for nothing left wing Democrats now who seek to use the Comey situation to take out this president. All right, sir, thank you for your call. All right, appreciate it, good call. Did you know that our $20 trillion national debt, fiscal operating debt, is estimated to be $40 million in the next 12 years? I'm not kidding about this. Trillion. You know we have over $200 trillion in unfunded liabilities? In 10 years, that's going to be over $400 trillion. It's unimaginable. It's mind-boggling. You know, a debt train this large can only be headed towards disaster. As we print more and more dollars, we, we lose more and more buying power. 
Investors know that it's not what you have, but what you keep. And that's why they diversify their portfolios. They diversify their portfolios to help keep their buying power strong when the dollar gets weak. PM Capital understands wealth preservation. Helping you keep your buying power is their goal. Many investors are diversifying their portfolios and IRAs right now with gold and silver. I know these people at PM Capital. I know Scott Carter. I've known him for a decade. Honorable, honorable man. Don't be caught on the tracks of the debt train disaster. Diversify today. Learn more by claiming your free PM Capital Investor Guide and for a limited time, receive $500 in free gold or silver on qualifying purchases. That is a great deal. All you have to do is call them. Just dial pound 250. That's pound 250. And say the keyword Mark Levin. That's pound 250, keyword Mark Levin. PM Capital Specialists are standing by right now. Call pound 250, say Mark Levin. Or visit MarkLevinGold.com. That's Mark, L-E-V-I-N, Gold.com. The key is any good advisor, financial advisor, you need to diversify. There are no good financial advisors who tell you diversify but don't include gold or silver. Why wouldn't you? You don't put all your eggs in the same basket. We know this. You don't buy all stocks, all bonds, all real estate. Stay in all cash, buy all hard metals and so forth. And so, but you diversify. And by diversifying, I think you should include gold and silver. This is the place to go to. PM Capital. PM Capital. Again, call pound 250, keyword Mark Levin. That's pound 250, keyword Mark Levin. These is a wonderful new sponsor. And yet Scott Carter, one of the principals at PM Capital, is an old buddy of mine known him for a very, very long time, and I trust him completely. That's pound 250, keyword Mark Levin. We'll be right back. Mark Levin. The New York Times committed the greatest act have journalistic malpractice, even worse, when we refused to cover the Holocaust during the Second World War. What kind of a so-called newspaper does that? A newspaper owned and led by liberal Jewish people. This is the same newspaper of record that blew off Fast and Furious, the IRS scandal, Benghazi, the multiple scandals related to the Iran deal, the Hezbollah scandal with Obama covering for Hezbollah, the domestic surveillance scandal in the last administration and in the last campaign, the Holocaust-denying New York Times, now trying to create an issue because the President's counsel told Sessions, why are you recusing yourself? Don't recuse. Oh, my God, that must be obstruction of justice. Maybe they don't understand what obstruction of justice is. Hillary destroying emails. Now, that would be obstruction of justice. Just for you.
officially over. The federal government is shut down, and the weekend begins right now. We salute our armed forces, police officers, firefighters, and emergency personnel. That's right. Good night, Spritey. Good night, Griffey. Good night, Pepsi. Good night, Smokey. Good night, Zelda. Get ISIS. Get the Taliban. Get Hezbollah. Get Hamas. Get Al Qaeda. Get all those subhuman cockroaches. See you on Monday.